My name is Andy Lee. Uh, I'm a bass player in lots of bands in the Midlands. Um, I started playing bass when I was 16. Uh, my brother wanted to form a band and he didn't want me to play any kind of cool instruments like the guitar or singing or keyboard. And they were looking for um, some chimpanzee to thumb along bass in the background and so I bought myself a bass guitar and I did in fact join his band. I started playing the four strings, drumming around, um, went to university, played there, swapped a guitar a bit for about 10 years, then came back to bass guitar. Years went by and I've been in and out of lots of different bands, constantly in a band for 25 years. Um, and then at about five, six years ago, I decided um, I wanted to build the guitars. Kind of music I like would be Black Sabbath very much. Geezer Butler's my hero. Um, the kind of bass guitar sound I've got, very similar to him. Staying in the um, the same key of E and then noodling about. Like, that's definitely my style. And also like going back to the 80s, a band called New Model Army. It's one of my favourite bands. The bands I'm currently in at the moment, um, there's a band called Flatfoot, which is a kind of 50s pop based band where we just enjoy ourselves and I just do 12 bar blues backwards and forwards up and down the fret and that's quite enjoyable and there's a band called Coyote Grove. Coyote Grove is a um, singer songwriter I know he writes and um, plays all the music and then we just all gather together like a collective and um, we put all the, the music together and do some gigs. And the other band I'm in which is I suppose my main gigging band is called Fret Wolf and that's, um, that's a bit of a blues rock band. We do a lot of things like Black Sabbath all the way up to ZZ Top. Um, play to a lot of bikers, they kind of like that kind of music. Bit of motorhead. So I began building guitars six years ago. I was kicking around a holiday park in Wales and I was a bit bored and the wife was you know, saying, let's go to the beach again. <sighs> okay, let's go to the beach again. And then um, I was bimbling around eBay and um, I saw, oh, wait a minute, what's this? It's a, uh, a kit where you can build your own bass guitar. So I'll do that, put a bass together. That'd be a laugh and that'd keep me busy for the rest of the summer holiday. So I did that. So we put this bass guitar together and it sort of whetted my appetite. And then I watched lots of, um, lots of other guitarists online on YouTube and they were doing the same, but they were starting from a fresh plank of wood. And so I thought, well, I can do that. So I ordered a fresh plank of wood and I cut out my own shape. Um, I bought myself uh, a neck and all the um, accoutrements that go with the bass guitar and I put it together and it was an absolute abject horlix of a guitar so i thought oh, okay okay first guitar big mistake let's uh let's knock that on the head and then my friend said no come on have another go so i i had another go i bought another piece of wood and this time from you know learning mistakes from the first time i put together a nice uh, a nice bass but i sort of learned my mistakes and realized how to make a nice body of the guitar and then after that, I'd sort of got challenges from my friends. They said, can you make this kind of guitar for me? Can you make that? And so I thought, well, yeah, okay, then I can do that. Um, and I bought patterns from the internet, like um, little templates, and I built, started to build a lot of Telecaster guitars because I've always liked Telecaster guitars. 
and then I expanded and made um, Telecaster guitars that I've hollowed out, hogged out with a router so they were semi-acoustic, put lovely different tops on them so different interesting coloured wood, went over the top and um, from there I started to think well really I ought to go the next hog and I ought to um, build my own pickups because pickups are quite expensive you know, if you want a decent sounding guitar you've got to have decent pickups and uh, sort of developed an idea from how to wind um, guitar pickups and bass pickups and what kind of tricks you need to do what patterns you need to place in the in the windings and um, what kind of magnets to use of course and the strength of those magnets And so I then started making Stratocaster guitars, um, bass guitars, um, like a precision bass or a jazz bass. And I make my own style basses. And then as the years passed, um, I just sort of developed my skills really. Um, a bit more ambitious every time. So I made that nice EMG pickup, but typically I got bored of it. Um, another version of it, but with a poplar burl top, same guitar. Um, again, I got bored of it. The woods that I use, um, I mainly stick to African mahogany, which is called Sapili. I do that because it sands really nicely and um, it's got a really nice tone to it. Uh, it's very easy wood to work with. Um, you don't wear out your tools too much with um, Sapili. Um, for the necks, I use maple mainly, but when I'm doing a, a Les Paul style guitar, obviously I'll use the same material as the body, so that would be either mahogany or Sapili. I have made maple bodies, they're okay, but um, I tend to find them to be, you know, on the trebly side when you're playing a bass guitar that's made of maple. It's, um, it's got a nice tone to it, but it tends to be too trebly, so I like the deeper sounder of like the mahogany or the uh, sapini, which I use mainly. Um, I have got um, a stock of red alder, it's American red alder, which is fantastic. It's um, easy to work with and it's got a nice tone. And I've also got a stock of English alder, which is completely different wood. Um, it's got a beautiful colour grain to it though. Um, it's uh, really, you know, twisted hard life. Alder tends to grow by riversides um, and of course rivers flood. And so you can see that in the grain, the wood, the grain's very, very um, troubled, I suppose you could say. And you get beautiful um, patterns in, in that. And it's also very light wood, it's very good acoustically, um, and so I've got quite a stock of that which I use, but mainly it's um, it's Sapelia. I have made a lot of teak guitars, because I came across a big stock of teak for a small amount of money, so I've built quite a few guitars for people out of teak, and they seem to be very happy with them. Teak's very oily, uh, which is difficult, but if you treat it with uh, methylated spirits it tends to take the oil out of the uh, the top layer and then of course you let the oil I don't know swill around the wood I don't know what that means but if you leave it a while and then you take it off again with uh, methylated spirits it tends not to be a problem and it takes the paint and the lacquer very nicely The wood I choose for the fretboards, it's mainly maple and ebony, just because you can get your hands on it. Rosewood, very difficult to get your hands on now because um, there's a ban, worldwide ban on Brazilian rosewood or something like that. So I just use ebony, Gabon ebony. Um, you can buy that on eBay, very nice. Put it through your planer, taking certain it'll come out beautiful. Or just use a piece of maple. 
um, and then uh, you can buy lots of lovely figure maple or just plain maple. Um, how I choose my wood, uh, it used to be actually quite a random process. I would look on eBay and think, oh, that looks nice, and uh, you'd buy it. Um, and the people on eBay are, are pretty good, actually. They'll be very honest. They'll say, oh, this has got checks in it or knots in it. And that basically means splits or there's, you know, a gnarly knot right in the wrong place. Um, you know, like it's sitting proud on your guitar. You don't want that. Unless, of course, you make a feature of it. Um, but what I then do is um, you, get, you get to know the people who make um, wooden double glazing. And uh, they make wooden conservatories and that kind of stuff and they use a lot of sapili um, because obviously it's a nice hardwood and you just see you've got any offcuts and they've always got offcuts and so um, you want something that's uh, got a nice you know nice grain to it looks just like an old mahogany door you know you can see those old 70s style doors um, beautiful uh, grain in them and you want to try and if you're going to have a knot you you, you want to make you, you know have a think about what you're going to use that guitar for and so if it's got a knot that's okay because you can paint that guitar as long as you sand it properly and get rid of the, um, the surface so when you look at the surface you filled in all the grain and it you know it's completely smooth that's totally fine but if you're going to use it um, with the grain exposed and you're just going to lacquer or oil finish the guitar then you, you basically need to have a completely um, beautiful blemish free piece of wood and of course you know you can get that you can get that on eBay but it does cost more um, and so I'm not too particular about those uh, those kind of blemishes and those problems when I'm going to paint the guitar but um, when you you know when you're just going to oil finish it or lacquer it then you, you've got to have something nice Um, yeah, so that's basically it for wood. It's usually maple for necks, so Fender bass guitars, they're all maple. And if it's a Gibson bass guitar, it's always all either mahogany or sapini that I use. Okay, so when cutting out your guitar, you uh, you want to have a shape. So if you're going to do your own shape guitar, make yourself an MDF template. Go to B&Q or Homebase, buy yourself a nice big sheet of MDF, draw out the shape that you want, then cut that out with a bandsaw, sand it down beautifully smooth. That's your template. Then draw around your substrate piece of wood that you're going to use and then get your bandsaw cut very close to the line as like close as you can the better without cutting into the, your, your line and you have a very rough outline of the guitar then from there you use your template you stick that on um, go to crimson guitars any vi video there you'll see him using the super glue trick um, that's very simple then you glue on your template to the top of your guitar and you use what's called a profile router and that basically is a very very fast spinning blade with a bearing at the top and the bearing runs around your template and then you have a very lovely smooth as long as you use a nice sharp um, template cutter you get a very, very smooth finish, which you can then sand further from there. Sanding, um, Sanding is a bane of every luthier's life because you have to do lots of it. 
Um, if you get yourself a very nice random orbital sander, palm sander, then they're, they're superb because you can just buy very cheaply off Amazon. You can buy lots of pads that you, you Velcro stick onto your um, sander and you go through those um, very, very quickly. So, you know, you get in the packets of about eight or nine. Anyway, so you have your random orbital sander that will sand things flat, that will gouge if you want them. You can spend time on certain areas with that. When you're being intricate, you need to use obviously sandpaper in your hands for that i would guarantee you won't get anything better than something called 3m it's fantastic paper it doesn't clog and it lasts for ages it doesn't rip very easily either fantastic once you've um cut out your your template with your router you might think oh that's sp splendid that's beautiful it's not you basically have to think if you're going to do binding you have to do the binding rebate or rabbit if you are from the US and then you glue your binding in and then once you've done that you then need to tidy up the sides so it's super smooth and so your your router will leave all kinds of horrible little nicks and cuts and it won't be very smooth you'll think it looks smooth but it's not and so you then need to start off with 80 grit and get it smooth and then go to 120 and then up to 240 uh, etc go through the larger the larger the number of grits it says on the packet the smoother it's going to finish your guitar it's very important to do that because somebody's going to touch it and hold it and feel it and if it's super, super silky smooth they're going to appreciate it more assemble your guitar string it out and start playing it you've got to think about what it's got to look like if you go with a bare piece of wood actually that might look pretty cool but it's going to pick up dirty sticky marks um, and again there's lots of people that said yeah go with that dirty sticky marks it will look worn in and loved and there's a whole market out there for people doing road worn and relict looks as, as a finish there but um, to be fair, if you've spent a good 20 hours making this guitar out of your spare time, you don't want it to look like a dog's breakfast. So you need to treat the wood. And there's lots of things you can do. You could just paint it, or you could put an oil finish on it, or you could put lacquer on it. And you can have a choice of lacquers, matte lacquer, or glossy lacquer, satin lacquer, you know, you, you name it, you can pick it. So what you do next is you need to make sure you've sanded it very flat. You've sanded everything flat. And if you're using a wood like mahogany or you're using sapili, they've got grain. And that grain means there's like tiny little divots. So you need to fill that with grain filler first. And you need to pick the color. Obviously, if you've got mahogany, you get mahogany colored grain filler. And that's like a paste that you put in and that fills up all the tiny little pores and holes in the wood that you think they aren't there but as soon as you put a finish on them you'll see them and it'll annoy you you've just spent hours developing this beautiful shine and finish and you can look at it and see the grain that'll annoy you so you basically sand it as flat as you can after filling the grain and so I then learned that you've got to leave your lacquer um, for a good day between coats if you want a nice deep shine. Um, it says on the rattle cans, oh, 20 minutes between coats, don't do that. You give yourself a day between each coat and you might be impatient want to get it done. Don't be impatient. Just let it sink in, let it go off, then put another coat. If it takes a week for you to put your lacquer on, it takes a week, get on with something else. And then once you've got your lacquer on, you need to flat it back and that's important to flat it back go in with maybe a thousand grit and then you have a nice big wide block of wood some water to lubricate it and then you sand it back and you think this is crazy I've just spent 10 or 15 quid on a can of lacquer and I'm just sanding it off but the finish you get is great and then you could add some more lacquer and when you've done three or four coats you can let it dry sand it back and then do another three or four coats and you get a really deep shine Uh, 
Um, or you could go matte. Matte lacquer is great because you only need about two or three coats of that and it looks wonderful. And that's the general trend at the minute to uh, go with matte look. I, I like a matte look. Um, or you could just leave it bare without the paint. Some paints you can buy very, very cheaply um, have a lovely finish. They fill in all the gaps and all the grain holes. Maybe you do enough coats and um, yeah, it doesn't even need a finish after that. got your guitar nice and shiny and it's all assembled your necks bolted into your body uh, you've got to start thinking about your electronics you've got to put your pickups in and you've got to put your controls in so when you first do this for the first time you, you're looking around the internet and everyone's calling it a pot you think what's what's a pot of course what they mean is a potentiometer it's your control knobs and then you've got logarithmic Oh, 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 or audio, what's an audio log And then you have to research all of this electronics. Luckily, I'm, I'm a physics teacher by trade, so I know a little bit about electronics, but I couldn't solder for anything. So I had to learn to solder very, very quickly. Um, I'm still improving that now. Um, the hardware that you put on your guitar is actually quite important, but also sometimes can be completely unimportant. Uh, for instance, the tuning pegs that you have on a guitar, very important that you have nice tuning pegs on there that basically don't keep losing their tune, they keep their tension. But as there's a chap on the internet, his guitar doctor I think he is, he's um, very rightly saying that basically even the most rat infested, horrible old tuning peg should be able to keep its tune and, and if you've got a problem, it's often to do with your nut. So having some sort of mid-range value hardware on your super guitar that you just bought yourself, you're really enormously proud of, is actually okay. Don't price yourself out of the market. You might think, oh, this is my guitar. It's the only guitar I'm gonna have. I want it to be perfect. This so is probably not. It's probably gonna be about the first of a dozen that you, you make, or maybe more if you get really into it. So your hardware, you get mid-range, it's gonna be good enough. All you want for, for instance, tuning pegs, you basically want it to hold its tune as best you can. And if you're you know, making guitar for a rampant lead player, it's never gonna hold its tune anyway because they bend the strings too hard and it keeps going out of tune anyway. If you're going to um, have a bridge, it's a good idea to buy a nice bridge. If you're making it a cheap guitar, then you're, you might as well not bother, but go for mid-range. Like Wilkinson is actually really quite good. Um, and Goto, uh, they produce really nice bridges. But the, the metal, the metal is quite important. If you have brass as a metal that you're using, that's gonna be better than zinc, okay? Because brass is a mixture of copper and zinc. Um, zinc is okay, they're pretty good. It conducts sound very, you know, very nicely that the brass will conduct sound better, but you might be thinking that you'll notice the difference, but I'm pretty sure you won't. So mid-range, mid-level hardware is gonna be okay. Something like 30 pounds for your bridge, um, if you've got guitars, something around 20 to 30 pounds for your tuning forks or pegs. If you've got a bass, something around 30 pounds for your, um, your bass pegs there as well, your bass tuning pegs, that's gonna be enough because um, mainly it's going to be in your fingers, your tone. Pickups are not magical. There is no dark art to making a pickup, and so the pickup that you get from Seymour Duncan, and I'm not gonna knock them, they are exceptionally good pickups. But the value that they add is huge because there's this dark, mysterious rumor going around that only Seymour Duncan can make a pickup or um, one of a pick, you know, a Gila or something like that, take your pick. And these Chinese people, they can't mind a pickup. No, dreadful, aren't they? That's a load of rubbish. You know, pickups are basically copper wire, 
and a magnet and they work on the um, generator effect principle and there is there is something to it it's not easy to do because you need to wind one pickup you need let's say a Stratocaster pickup perhaps something between six and eight thousand turns six and eight thousand turns around the central pole magnets and if you're doing that by hand it's going to take you a year um, but it might sound fantastic so people do that by a machine I've got a machine that I've um, bought from a company down in Devon they're fantastic but it did cost me a lot of money and of course it works like a CAD CAM machine and it plugs into an old um, dusty laptop that I've got this is about 12 years old which I only have for this purpose and so you program into this thing uh, to this automatic pickup winder how many turns you want and how many turns per layer you want and then you build up your own pattern so if you buy a very very cheap pickup from China what they will do is they will say right quickly put perhaps 150 turns per layer going across from the bottom of the pickup all the way up to the top and they'll do that uh, and they'll make that in about three or four minutes and they'll say there you go there's a pickup solder it up put it in the guitar and off we go and that's where Seymour Duncan comes in and says whoa what what magnet are you using with that oh we're just using a fridge magnet that we found from the fridge magnet factory and that's why people like um, Seymour Duncan and all the other people that they're equally good they um, produce pickups that sound excellent because they actually care about what magnets go in um, they care about how those magnets have been produced how they've been cast and they get a nice magnet in there and they also care about the pattern that they're turning their wire on they don't just say let's just go a thousand Bosch off we go although there is a rumor that's exactly how Gibson do theirs but I'm not sure that's true and so once you have a pattern established that works for you I've got one for me um, I then produce pickups using that particular pattern and I use the same thing whether I'm winding bobbins for um, let's say a P90 or uh, a Les Paul bobbin that's going into one of the hum humbuckers or if it's just one for a Telecaster or a Stratocaster I always use the same number and I get the same scatter pattern from doing that and I get a lovely clarity there now the number of turns that you put on is going to dictate how brown the sound or how trebly the sound is going to be and the band I'm in mainly the guitarist likes really rich thick wide brown sounds so I put a lot of turns on there for him but if I'm making a guitar for somebody who likes just the delicate clarity then you're going to put less on there so perhaps you might want to put 6,000 turns on your Stratocaster for that person and then they'll be able to get um, lots of treble and delicate clarity when they're playing their lovely Strat um, but if you've you know, got a person who wants to play in a heavy rock band and, or maybe a blues band and they want to hear that fat wide blues sound then you make the sound deeper and browner and wider by adding more turns So making the pickups is, um, it's not a dark art, it's a science, you can work it through through um, trial and error. I've been doing that bit for five years and I've got to a point where, yes, I know if he wants that sound, that's how I'll achieve it. So recently I've got into putting artwork onto guitars and the way I do that is I get my daughter who's a talented artist to either paint on the guitars or to get her to paint on a you know sketch pad or sketchbook and then I photoshop it and then um, I send it off to a company to make a decal 
and then I put the decal on the guitar. And I've got into doing matte black guitars with shiny black decals on there. So you, you know, pick it out in the light, you'll be able to see. If you're doing a gig like, oh, that's a black guitar, what is that? And oh my God, there's something on it, what is it? Um, or you can just go, you know, blanket white decal on a black guitar or a white guitar with a black decal so you can see all the artwork and that's, um, that's kind of nice. But it does take a lot of time to Photoshop it and it does uh, obviously mean there's an extra bit of expense at the end and you've got to find an artist that you like or you can steal a bit of artwork off the internet which is also pretty good and have that put on your guitar so think about that if you're, you're doing that you might be able to Photoshop and send it off to a company. I'm using a company called Cynomatic.co.uk. I think they're based in Sweden and they're sending me through the decals to do the guitar at this minute. I'm looking forward to doing that. It gives you a lovely professional finish and people will, you know, they'll be gasping when they see it. They're like, oh, how did you do that? Oh my goodness, what's that? So once you've spent all this money on your guitar, you've um, strung it up the first time and it plays hideously and your chest falls and you're feeling like you're going to pick up the guitar and smash it against the ground. Don't do that. You can either send it to your local luthier who will set it up for you at a cheap price or you could do it yourself. Go onto YouTube, there are lots of instructional videos about how to set up a guitar. It's quite easy, all you need is some feeler gauges and the Allen key and a capo and a good digital tuner and you can sort out the intonation, you can sort out the string height and you might want to file the nut back, of course if you've bought a guitar um, off the shelf you might want to have the nut filed correctly so you've got the right string height. But apart from that, it's very, very simple. Don't be afraid to do it yourself. You can't break it, for goodness sake. You've just built it. How could you break it? Or if you think, no, 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 I'm, I can't do this. I couldn't possibly. You've got a local luthier. Look them up on the internet and they'll do it for you for a cheap price and it will play beautifully after that. Okay, so you might have the most expensive guitar in the world. You've spent £20,000 on your new Gibson, blah, 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 yada, yada, and you are the envy of every known guitarist in the world. But as soon as you plug it in and you start playing it, the damn thing keeps going out of tune. Sound familiar? Well, that is because you have to have your guitar set up. Now I might be exaggerating, if you bought a £20,000 guitar I suspect that somebody would have spent a good hour on it setting it up properly. But if you buy a mid-range guitar like a £1,000 and you bought it from GAC or Andersons, I am telling you they have just taken it out of a packet and given it to you. Or they won't even take it out of the packet, they'll send you the box through the post. It has not been kissed by angels, it has not been licked clean by kittens, it has just come off the factory floor. And they are making hundreds of those guitars a day. They do not set them up other than giving them a quick once over. So you could have a dreadful guitar, but you could, you know, which is spent 150 pounds on. You send it to um, your local luthier or guitar doctor, whatever you want to call it, and he'll hand you back, or she will hand you back, a magnificent sounding and playing guitar for minimal money. Thank you. 
The other thing you'll find when you're a luthier is the guitars are never finished. You never will get to a point when you think you're happy. It's only the point that the person who's playing it is happy, then that's okay, it's left the building, it's up to them now. But you'll always want to improve it or you'll think that the finish isn't quite right. Or you'll want to tweak something on the height of the strings or file the nut a little bit more. And you just have to let it go once you've made it and they've They've said, yes, it's mine, and they'll run off and go and gig with it. They'll enjoy it. They'll come back and say, my string broke. And you'll have to explain to them that that's up to them to, to sort that out. Well, but they might come back and say, um, actually, uh, there's a bit of a buzz here, a bit of this, that, and the other, and then just, you know, sort that out. Uh, the customers, um, I wouldn't really call them customers. I'm, I'm an amateur who does a professional job, I suppose you could call me. I'm basically a teacher full time and this is just a hobby for me. So um, if you do want me to build your guitar, you might have to wait a while to do that. Although I have done some things quite quickly. Um, recently, for instance, it's been um, grandchildren or children of my friends, they need a guitar. I've also got some friends who are in some national bands and so I've built guitars for um, a band that is a tribute act touring the country called Ultimate Coldplay. The two guitars that the guitarist plays there, they're mine, I built those for him. There's a band called the Roy Orbison Story, which is of course another big tribute act touring the country, um, built the guitars for the rhythm guitarist in that band as well. Um, so mainly I, I build for, for my friends and they ask for a guitar, can you do this for me, I've got a project for you, I need it to sound like this, that and the other. And then um, I, I do that basically, which does mean for my other friends, I have to drop all their projects for a moment and then, you know, to do something. You've got a month to do it, right, okay. Um, but the, the customers really basically come to me, they, they want something, or if I'm bored, I'll just make something for myself or I'll make something for one of my friends and just give it to them and they'll, you know, the face will light up going, oh, this is this for me? Um, basically, mostly my friends are musicians, um, so I build guitars for them. The music you can hear in the background has been played on instruments I've made. Um, by Coyote Grove. Um, he's a talented chap, a filmmaker, musician, singer, songwriter. So basically I, I, I've made guitars for himself and a lot of my other friends in other bands and, and um, I just do this for fun. If you want a guitar you'll have to probably wait some time because um, I'm a full-time teacher and I only really work at the weekends.
hope you've enjoyed watching me and uh, having a look inside my creative process where I let off some steam. Anyone can do this, you really can, you just have to have some patience. You've also got to realise that Rome wasn't built in the day, you're going to make some mistakes. It doesn't matter, you'll get it right on the next one and the next one and the next one. But what you need to do is learn by every single guitar that you make and the next one will be that little bit better. That's all for now, happy building.